Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board and start again. Let's try that again. I felt a little too rushed. Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this is going to be Where Are They Now? Or some other clever name if I can think of something. Well, we'll figure it out. Either way, this series is going to be directly inspired by two things. That's why I held up two fingers there. Two things directly inspired. Number one, the obvious one, is going to be Tom Vassell on the Dice Tower regularly has a series. I think it's weekly. Maybe it's every other week. I don't know what it is. But either way, it's a look back series of reviews where he looks at things that they've reviewed last year, five years, and ten years ago to see how ratings have changed, where they are, how things have gone with that game. Just, you know, the nature of reviews is that they change over time sometimes. Our opinions change. Other games change the landscape. Things like that. More plays expose flaws at different player counts in different situations. Different things can happen with games. The second thing it's inspired by is actually going to be a video going up on this channel I want to say on Sunday, but I could be wrong. It might get moved around. But a video going up on this channel sometime soon is going to be a video called Review Drift. This is a conversation that Johnny Pack Canton, a designer, you may be familiar, familiar with him. He started a conversation in a Facebook group about the concept of Review Drift, the concept of reviewers and putting out content on games based on, you know, having the game for two, two weeks, three weeks and getting four or five plays and maybe eight plays. It might be a very different ecosystem than the nature of, well, playing a game as someone who owns a game for a year, for two years and getting multiple plays at multiple player counts. So it's going to be partially inspired by that as well, which is one of the reasons I wanted to do it on this channel. And you, I do encourage watching that video when you have a chance, when it actually goes up. It, it's a very real problem with the nature of any reviewer in this space. There is a limitation on the way we review games and the way games are meant to be played and experienced in a collection over time. And then lastly, at the end of this video, I will be asking for feedback and feedback on how you want to see this series continue on this channel. In general, whether you're interested in it to begin with, and then secondly, in what format it continues, because... This particular video is going over everything I reviewed on this channel a year ago and prior. Meaning I didn't start heavily diving into review content on this channel until, um, I don't remember exactly when, but uh, mid-2020. Until then I did reviews very infrequently. And so this is going to be a summation of every single game I reviewed on the channel up until that point. But what I'm going to be doing going forward is in some way I need to start covering what I reviewed and reviews became more and more frequent, more and more common on this channel. So I'll be looking for feedback at the end of this video, timestamps down below in case you want to jump to there. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Now, everything you see on the table is not necessarily everything we're covering, but because some of these games have already left and my opinions on games that left for the most part will not usually change. To begin with, there are going to be four Kickstarters I covered, four previews I covered that I have not gotten the final game or have not had an opportunity to jump in on those games, and so my opinion hasn't changed much. Those are going to be Token Terrors, North Guard, Lizard Wizard, and Dead Reckoning. As far as those four games, general notes on them, Token Terrors was a light little skirmish game involving these tokens. You drafted tokens, and it was a solid little skirmish game. Skirmish games are not my jam. Uh, back then, and this can be true for the whole list, back then I didn't actually give ratings to games, so I'm going to be applying what I think my rating would have been at the time, but it, it is involved some degree of guesswork because I didn't actually sit there and take the time to rate the games. Token Terrors probably would have been a 3 for me. I enjoyed it, but skirmish games aren't really my go-to. I only really played it for the sake of getting in the coverage of the game. So I got in, I don't remember what it was, I got in like 2 or 3 plays. And I enjoyed it, but did not love it because it's a skirmish game. And usually specific skirmish games are what, what, I, what, what works for me in my collection. But no real opinion change because I haven't played it since I covered it. North Guard is going to be the same thing. Like I said, Kickstarter preview. Didn't really have an opportunity to play it since I covered it. I enjoyed it. Had some critiques with it. Really liked the artwork. Really liked the deck building. Really liked aspects of it. While feeling that other aspects of it were not what I wanted. And I know that many of the complaints I had are things they actively were addressing because... They were, you know, it's a Kickstarter. They're just still addressing or, you know, like the last card problem. There's a problem with the last card not really having an impact. And there, it's something that they were looking into and addressing in different ways. I'm very curious to see the final game when it does eventually hit retail. But it's one that at the time, well, my opinion hasn't really changed in it. So no real change there. 
Lizard Wizard. Lizard Wizard is another game that I have not had the opportunity to play since I covered it. That one's actually going to be arriving very shortly. Very excited for that one. I really like Lizard Wizard. Or Northgard, by the way, probably would have been a 3 out of 5 for me. Uh, Lizard Wizard is a game that probably would have been... It's a tough one. It's probably right between a 3 or, and a 4 for me. It's like really on the cusp. I don't know what I would have given. My current excitement level of, of getting it back in my collection and being able to play it is probably a 4. I don't know where I would have drifted back then. I'd have to like rewatch the review and sense where I was. But I enjoyed Lizard Wizard while also having some complaints about it. But again, haven't really dived back into it, so no real change there. Dead Reckoning, another game I'm really excited for. This is one where I don't know how much drama you followed back then, so I'm not going to overly get into it. Very short version is I didn't actually back it, but I have since traded for a pledge. So I do have a pledge coming my way, but it's one that I'm incredibly excited for. And it's one that, I mean, this is by AEG. And I loved playing that game. I, I had a lot of fun playing it, but again, haven't played it since my review because of the nature of Kickstarter previews. All I'm saying is I'm excited for it, and it will show up in another look back series at some other point. When I look at things that were from two years ago or three years ago, I don't, again, we haven't figured out the exact format. We'll be iterating upon that as things go along. And that's going to be the previews I covered. From there, we move into the retail games, which the rest of this list is going to be retail games that I covered. Retail doesn't mean I didn't back it on Kickstarter, just means retail's the wrong word. Games that actually showed up that are not prototypes, how about that? And those are going to be two games that left and I did not play again since the review. There are some other games that left, but I did play again, we'll explain that. So to begin with, is going to be Ragusa. Ragusa is a game that I gave that one, I would have given that one. Oh, Dead Reckoning, by the way. I'd have to play it more, but it's either a four or a five out of five. Like one of those two. It's, I really, I really like Dead Reckoning. I need to play it more though. But the, uh, Ragusa, Ragusa is going to be a game that for me would have been a two out of five. I did not enjoy that one. It still would be a two, but again, I have not played it since. So take it with a grain of salt. It's one that I got rid of in general games that I got rid of. Unless I got them back and had another chance to try them, their ratings aren't going to change much. I, I did not love Ragusa. I, I felt it was a little more complicated than what I liked without really giving me the reward. I'd rather play Catan if I wanted a simple game, but resource collection or whatnot. It, it's fine. It's not that it was bad. It's that it didn't really do anything to me that felt worth the extra investment of complexity compared to just playing a standard uh, resource collection uh, Euro game like Catan or whatnot. Uh, and nothing against Catan. Catan's a great game. Catan to me is a solid 3 out of 5. Ragusa was a little more complicated without the payoff for the complexity, so didn't really do it for me. Some aspects that I liked. I liked the aspects of your actions getting increasingly more powerful as you put people out. There were some things it did that I enjoyed, but overall not one I'd want to return back to. Rackbusters. Rackbusters is a tough one for me. Rackbusters is a 3 out of 5 for me, uh, but like so close to being better. Rackbusters is going to be from Mythic Games. Really enjoy that one. Again, haven't played it again since the review, so no change. It was a 3, still going to be a 3. I really enjoyed the, the art, the miniatures, all that, and the general system that it seemed to be giving. The practical application of it is Rackbusters to me felt like every single thing was rolling, not rolling dice, was drawing cards for the noise, the, the taking noise test basically. Every three seconds was taking a noise test for something else in the game. Combine that with a, a few minutes too many issues with either rules or cleanliness or just streamlineness or just giant piles of, of diversified equipment that didn't really matter enough but you had to separate it. I felt Rackbusters could have used a little bit more streamlining. Really the biggest, all those other issues I could probably just get over. Uh, the biggest issue for me was it just the stealth system didn't feel like a stealth system. It felt overly complicated in terms of what it was trying to achieve. I like the premise of it. I like the concept. If Mythic does return with a, uh, if, if they come back to the table with a Rackbusters 2.0, I will 100% be reading the rules, paying attention to the rule changes to see whether it's one for me or not. Because I still... I still feel like Rackbusters is one of those games that, you know, got away, that wasn't for me, but I wanted it to be for me. Uh, moving on to the other games on the list, which are going to be games that I have continued to play since I last reviewed them. Starting off with Food Chain Magnet, which isn't on this table, but not all games are. Food Chain Magnet is going to be one that I reviewed. I, I don't know if I officially reviewed it. I just did a, a response to uh, Tom Vassell actually played it. did a first impressions video of it where he didn't really enjoy it. I did a response to Tom. This is one of my first videos, like my fifth video on the channel. But I really, really like Food Chain Magnet. It has, it started as a five for me, five out of five. It has continued to remain a five out of five. I have since gotten the Ketchup Mechanism expansion. I have not played with the Ketchup Mechanism expansion. I will say that while some ratings might stay exactly the same, Food Chain Magnet has gone down for me. Still a 5, 
but it's gone down from like my third favorite game of all time to like my eighth or ninth or somewhere. I'd have to check where I last put it, and I don't know where I'll put it this coming year. It certainly has dropped, but dropping from three to like eight in my scoring is is not a huge drop. It's one that I find so mentally taxing to play. It's so much mental energy that when I play it, I'm rarely in the mood for that kind of of. I'm really in the mood for something that's so mentally, like, it's going to be challenging, it's going to, I'm going to be thinking four turns in advance, it's, it's exhausting to play that game, which, depending on who you are, you might either understand that, or think, well, Alex, guy is weak sauce, go back to your little party games, Alex, could be, could be, I find a food chain magnet to be mentally taxing, incredibly fun, an amazing experience, but the, the mentally taxing aspect of it, where I just, I feel exhausted after I played it, means that, due to the nature of feeling exhausted almost all the time, it's one that I only sign up for actually playing it when I'm in the mood, I'm prepped, I'm ready, I'm energized, and it's not like the end of a long day where I then go to play Food Chain Magnet. So I really like it, still easily recommend it, still a 5 out of 5, but one that certainly has dropped a few spots just the more I've played that game. Monumental. Monumental has gone up. Monumental for me was a 3 out of 5 when I first played it. I really enjoyed it, but also it was really, really long. I had a, more, a few more complaints. I just, I, I like the miniatures. I like the art. I like the general Civ building or Civ abstraction, the 4X abstracted that it was giving us, but it just was really long, took up a lot of space on the table. I just had too many issues or complaints about it. In fact, to the point that I, I reviewed it, I liked it, but had issues, and then I was going to actually get rid of it because I was like, I don't know if I'll play this one. And Jeremy Howard, Jeremy Howard, who I love that guy to death, he was, he convinced me to keep it. He's like, nope, play it again, go ahead, give it a solo play. I didn't actually end up giving it a solo play, still have not played it solo, but it's one that I did play two player, like almost immediately after that, and I found that I enjoy Monumental most at two players. Three is still good. Four, I would not, you couldn't pay me to, I mean, you could pay, you could pay me to do anything, really. There's always a price point. But uh, I would not want to play it at four unless I were being paid. Uh, three, I would play it because of the additional player interaction. But two for me is so far the sweet spot with the caveat that I have not played it solo. Uh, for me, it's gone from a three, out of, a three out of five to a four out of five. I really enjoy it. Still can be a little long. Still is a glorified Dominion game, but I really, I really enjoy it. I like the cards. I like the, the, the civilizations. I love the, the miniatures, the art, the, the, the monuments, not the monuments, the, uh, the wonders, the general moving around the board. Lots of solid things that are really enjoyable happening in Monumental. Then we have Architects of the West Kingdom, which is a game that I actually did review, got rid of, got back, and got rid of again. So it's actually one of those games that I did get rid of, had second thoughts about, and tried it again. Now, Architects of the West Kingdom, when I first played it, was a 3 out of 5 for me. I enjoyed it, but I, like, I really like the aspect of Architects where you are putting down a character on the board, a worker placement, and then you're escalating that. You put down another, wor another worker, and your action's stronger. And you keep pushing that, waiting for someone to eventually capture you and stop your sequence of actions. So tempting, so rewarding, lots of fun. The rest of the game around that mechanic, I just don't like enough. It's not bad, I just don't like it enough to continue to keep it. It's one that, because of the fact that people love it so much, I actually got it back. I got it back. I got it back with the expansion to see if it's like for me or not for me. And, and the expansion definitely, I recommend the expansion easily. I think the expansion definitely improved the game. Gave me one more thing to be mindful of or to consider as I played it. But I got a few more plays in base, base game and the expansion and still ended up in the exact same spot for me. It's still a 3 out of 5. I still would never turn down a game. If I'm at a convention and someone wants to play Architects, I'll play Architects. I like it. I just don't love it. Still a 3 out of 5 for me. Still one that I think is very, very solid. I understand why people... I understand why people like it. I don't I don't get the love for the Shem Phillips games. But again, I understand. I recognize myself as being the odd one out. He has three games in the top 100. That is not nothing. That's not nothing at all. Then we have Airland and Sea. Airland and Sea was one that I was really hyped about. This was a 4 to 5 when I reviewed it, and it's a 4 to 5 now, although it certainly has gone up. Airland and Sea is one that continuously hits the table. It's a great filler game for two players, a great game to pull out when you have a few people, and every time, I mean, it's still not a 5 to 5. It doesn't have that depth that really has me, like, loving the game, but as far as the game goes, really enjoy it. Solid 4 to 5. It's got that, it only has 18 cards, and you figure out those 18 cards, and you play off your opponent, and then you choose when to pull back and withdraw, and when to, like, continue pushing it. Lots of fun decisions. Very well done. They're making another version of the game, actually, with cartoony artwork, which I will absolutely be getting. I'll only keep one of them. Probably. Almost certainly I'll only keep one of them. But uh, I'm definitely, sign me up for cartoony artwork. I don't have a problem with this this theme, but I do love 
good cartoony artwork. But yeah, Airland and Sea, still a 4 out of 5, but one that has certainly gone up. I've continued to appreciate it and enjoy it as I've played it. Then we have Horrified. Horrified is one that went down for me. That one started as a 4 to 5 and has since moved to a 3 out of 5. Again, a bit of guessing where my mind was at the time. But I really liked Horrified uh, when I first played it. I really enjoyed it. I felt it was a solid, cooperative game. Now, this is going to be true for many games in the same weight class as Horrified, where games, to a certain extent, and this is worth watching that review drift video that goes up on Sunday, to a certain extent, games that lack depth will have a degree of shininess when they first hit, and I'll like it, and I'll have fun, and I'll keep playing it, and then the more you play it, the less depth it has, the more that rating can slowly drop as you feel you've explored most of what the game can show you, and diving back in just has less appeal. I think Horrified is an excellent gateway game. I think it is a solid game to be recommended to people along with Pandemic or Stone Age or any number of other solid, easy to get into, has a degree of depth but not a ton of depth to that game. At the end of the day, Horrified is one that did drop for me over time because of the fact that it doesn't have that level of depth. I really like the way you can intermingle different monsters. That's something that does stand out very nicely. You can escalate the difficulty by having more monsters at attacking you and different monsters and then combine them to have some sort of puzzle to solve. I like it. Can recommend it, but it did move down to a four out of, uh, from a four out of five to a three out of five for me. A uh, cryptic. Cryptid is a tough one. It's a very interesting one. It's actually, they just announced that Cryptid, uh, Cryptid Mythic Monsters, Cryptid something. They announced an expansion, not expansion, a standalone game of Cryptid is going to be coming out. And I'll probably be getting it specifically because it's supposedly for two players. And that interests me off the bat. Cryptid is going to be a deduction game, a, a game where every game you play has one perfect spot on the board where things are. And you're trying to figure out what that spot is. And you're trying to figure out both through the one clue that you have but then also through the clues that your teammates, not teammates, your opponents have in the game. Because once you figure out everyone else's clue, then you can actually figure out where that mythical monster is. And it's a, a fascinating deduction game as you try to pinpoint where people's clues are by asking them questions and they'll answer those questions and you're challenging others to reveal information about what they know between the players at the table three or four players you will is it five i don't remember if it goes to five i've, I've only played it at three and four you'll deduce what other people know and then proceed to use what you know combined with what you think they know to ultimately figure out where the monster is very very solid game really enjoyed it I think it was, so for me, it stayed in the same position. It's a 3 out of 3, and it stayed as a 3 out of 3. When I first gave my review, I said at the time that I think this is one that has a limited shelf life in my collection. It very much is a good game, and I love the puzzle, but it's too specific and exact in what it's trying to do that I think it won't last in my collection long term. I think that as I get better at the game, uh, or as anyone gets better at the game, then it's inherently going to incentivize other people to not want to play it as much. It's very much a logic puzzle of a game, which if you like it, and if the players you're playing with all like, that could be great. But if you're playing with some people who are intrigued by it, and some people who are good at it, it's going to be a mismatch. And overall, that did turn out to be true. So it's one that did leave my collection as it stopped getting played once that initial appeal was gone. Started as a 3 out of 5, and continued as a 3 out of 5, but it's just, again, I think it's, I can eat, I recommend Cryptid as, as a game that's worth trying, as a game that's worth seeing if it's for you. Whether or not you keep it is a different story entirely. Moving on, we have Arena the Contest, which is over here. Arena the Contest. I haven't actually played that one that much since I reviewed it. I have played it more. Uh, I have an online play I played at one point. I have a few games I've gotten in of this one since I reviewed this one. Still really loving this. Arena the Contest was a 5 out of 5 when I reviewed it, and it's going to be a 5 out of 5 for me now. I don't think it's gone up. I don't think it's gone down either. My problem is I haven't played it enough or I haven't given alternative op options more of a chance. Like I haven't really dived into the campaign mode more to really see if my rating would get better or worse. I continue to really, really enjoy it as a... Well, actually, I've actually have tried... Since reviewing it, I've actually played it competitively, which I hadn't played until then. I don't think I don't think it's made my rating better. I think I still prefer it cooperatively, but I certainly see the appeal of it as a competitive game, uh, meaning I enjoy it. I would happily dive into it competitively again. It's a lot of fun to team up with your your players, whether you're playing it you know by yourself with your various characters or whether you're playing with actual teammates. It's a lot of fun to kind of team up, use your characters together, and ultimately defeat other people. A lot of fun. Like I really like rolling dice in this game. It's com it does have a degree of luck, which might make the cooperative game a better experience. Because cooperatively, you feel together as that luck hits. Competitively, if I'm rolling and always hitting and you get three or four misses in the game, that can certainly, you know, result in a slightly, like, a feeling that you did everything you could and just got ruined by the luck of the dice. 
I really like Arena of the Contest. I'm very excited for Tenaris Adventures. One of the reasons I haven't played it much since I reviewed it is as soon as I knew there was another expansion coming, I kind of like deprioritize it in my collection and play it less often because I want the new stuff. I want the upgraded miniatures, the new cars, the new content. It's not necessarily something that's logical, but when I have a lot of games, I, I prioritize the ones that don't have new content coming. Either way. But yeah, 5 out of 5, then 5 out of 5 now. Then we have Glenn Moore. And by the way, depending on when this video goes up, you actually have like a week left to get like Tenaris Adventures. I think they're closing their pledge manager August 24th, if I'm not mistaken. And I think this video is going up before then. So yeah, you can go ahead and try to still back Tenaris Adventures, all the expansion content, all of that stuff there. Next up, we have Glenn Moore, which is over here. Glenn Moore is going to be by Fun Tales Games, and that is a game that I gave it a 3 out of 5 at the time, and it's still going to be a 3 out of 5 for me now, although it's not fair yet because I haven't fully explored the game. Glenn Moore is a game that I really enjoy the tile-laying mechanism of the game. I really enjoy the escalation of putting down your tiles, of, of uh, triggering all the tiles around said tile, and then also having that person map where you're trying to figure out what other things you can combine with what you're doing. Meanwhile, the person who goes last always takes the turn, so you're on, always choosing between taking the tile you want, but the further you go ahead to get the tile you want means you'll be taking fewer turns, so it's always a balance of just how good for your combo is that tile that you're looking at on the board. Really enjoy that tension. To me, the problem with Glenmore is that past that little puzzle, the actual what's going on is not necessarily as as varied as I would potentially like. So I like Glenmore, I really enjoy it, but it's just it feels like the the puzzle is very intricate. The the actual diving into it past that, it, it doesn't you're not like you're, you're turning resources into other resources, rinse and repeat, it's kind of the same thing. Now, the reason my rating is quote-unquote unfair is because I haven't dived into any of the chronicles that this game gives you. This game gives you like eight different chronicles in the game, like a ton of different ways to explore and modify and diversify your experience, which would give me the variability I want out of it, but I haven't gone into those yet because sadly this doesn't one doesn't hit the table as much as I'd like. I actually like this more than anyone else in my group. I like it. I like it a lot, but they all are all willing to play it, so to speak. So it doesn't hit the table as much as I'd like. I have played it since that review. It stayed a three out of five for me because I haven't tried any of the modules. I really enjoy it. I like Lenmore a lot. I think in general, people give it a higher rating than I do. But again, don't get me wrong. I like it and I've owned it and it survives all the culls that I do in my collection because because it's it's tempting. I want to dive back into it and I want to try out those modules to see how that changes the rating. Two more. Cthulhu Death May Die. Cthulhu Death May Die was a 5 to 5 for me since I very first played this game, and it has continued to remain a 5 to 5 for me. I would say, if anything, has it gone down? Has it gone up at all? I don't think so. I think it's remained pretty stable. I mean, I'm sure since the very first play is one thing, but by the time I reviewed it, I already had multiple plays under my belt, and it's one that my wife and I continue to dive into on a repeated basis. It's one that we enjoy. We actually have a campaign going on. Uh, it's on Patreon. We have a the first episode we did on the channel, but the subsequent episodes have been on Patreon. We're currently up to episode three, and we'll be continuing to go through it uh, on Patreon. So that's one where my wife and I continuously play this game. We continuously dive back into it. I love the the powers, the abilities, the moving around the map, the, well, that's obvious, I guess. But really, the, the degree of going insane is what pulls me in about this game. I, I, I have a ton of fun just exploring my character and going insane, and then that end game tension is what gets me every single time. That aspect of having the Elder One ramping up as you ramp up, Every single game feels like it comes down to that final dice roll. We often win with one character left standing and the rest of them are all dead. I love the tension of that endgame of never really knowing how it's going to play out and who's going to win in Cthulhu Death May Die. Really solid game. Uh, I think it's remained basically exactly in my rankings. I don't know. It may have gone up or down one or two spots, but nothing worth noting whatsoever. Five out of five for me, both then and now. I continue to enjoy Cthulhu Death May Die. And then lastly is Marvel Champions, and this one saw a big shift. I reviewed this one from a hotel room in Argentina, I believe. I've, a long time, a long time ago. But I reviewed this one from a hotel room in Argentina. Uh, Marvel Champions was a game that when I first played it, I wasn't sold on it. I, I liked it. I enjoyed it, but I wasn't sold. And I continued to play it, and then I reviewed it, and I was... I was tempted enough to keep exploring this world. I was intrigued enough to just want to continue to dive in, to want to see more out of the Marvel Champions universe. But when I rated it, it was probably a 3 out of 5 for me. And now it's absolutely a 5 out of 5 for me. I love Marvel Champions. The more I've played this game, the more I've enjoyed it. It's one of these videos that I plan on doing eventually is going to be like top 10 games that 
every time I play them, I want to play them more. And Marvel Champions is going to be one of those games. Every single time I dive back into Marvel Champions, I'm like, why am I not playing this more? I should get rid of all my three out of fives. I should get rid of Glenn Moore. No offense, Glenn Moore. I should get rid of all those games that are mediocre on to... Not mediocre. Games that are good, but aren't giving me that high... Marvel Champions is an absolute delight. I love the I love the game. I love the deck building. Just a little quick deck building before you start. I mean, keep in mind, I went from being completely uncertain on it to having like two gigantic wooden boxes, wooden whatevers uh, for this game because, and I'll get more as I need to. I will get every single amount of content that they put out, despite the fact that I don't play it enough to justify that. I'm going to be irrational in my purchasing decisions because that's what I do when I really, really like a game. I'm not encouraging this behavior. I'm just telling you that I engage in it. In fact, a video I did a long time ago was like topped like five, five like uh, advices about collecting or whatever it is that I don't follow but should. One of them is I go all in on things even when I shouldn't. I will get all the content for Marvel Champions. Eventually one day, maybe I'll actually play it more. I play, still play it. I play it a ton, but I should play it more is what it comes down to. So Marvel Champions is going to be the biggest jump in this video, going from a 3 out of 5 to a 5 out of 5, a very, very large shift in terms of how strongly I feel about it. And so now this is the part where I ask for feedback. So in any given month, I do... So here's how it works. Here's my general schedule on the channel right now. Uh, generally, in any given week, I'm putting up two or three reviews. In any given month, I'm putting up between, I guess just do the math, between 12 and 15 reviews. Now, there's two ways I can handle this series going, well, three ways I can handle this series going forward. Way one is no one cares. You know, it's good. You saw the review the first time. You don't care for an update. It's all good. That's option one, in which case I just won't do this series. Option two is you would like to see the series, but it doesn't need to be its own dedicated video. Just every single week on my channel, I do. I have a regular video that goes up every single Saturday, the week in review. I could include in that the week in review from a year ago, just covering, okay, great, you know, and last year I reviewed these three games and here's how I feel about those. So it could be a segment of the week in review where I look back at the prior year. Option three is that once a month, I look at those 12 to 15 games I covered the year prior and go through those. So those are the three options on the table. The other thing that's not really relevant yet is at a certain point, we'll hit that two-year mark. And then the question is, do I look at two years? But we'll deal that one if, well, let's just do one thing at a time. Right now, we'll only be looking at the past year because I haven't been doing this long enough to look at the past two, three, four, five, and definitely not the last 10 years. So those are the things. I'm looking for your feedback. If I, you know, just basically don't care at all or would love to see it in the weekend review or would love to see a monthly dedicated video where you look at the last month a year ago. That is basically everything. I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Let me know in general. And as always, and until next time, have a good one.